Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for joining this uh, Connected Health Initiative uh, webinar. Goal here is to uh, talk about, you know, broadly, um, Connected Health Technologies and the COVID-19 Public Health Emergency. Um, there's um, uh, just just a bit of an overview, I think, of what, what we're what we're aiming to to address here today. Um, you know, is is I, I I think a lot of folks from 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 the from the healthcare community, obviously widely, but but also the digital stakeholders in the digital health community specifically have have been um, following the wide range of steps taken at different levels of the government. Uh, at the federal level, there's a variety of bills passed by Congress, tons of activity at different federal agencies. Um, states have taken numerous actions, even local governments have. Um, <clears throat> uh, yet, I think no one, it probably is not a very controversial statement to say that that more is, uh, much more is, pro is, is likely needs to be done. And um, uh, this uh, group of of people here on this uh, this webinar, I think, are are are, are an excellent uh, group of experts to share their views on that. Um, I, uh, I I can I, I will maybe just read their names, introduce them, and their org, and I'll I'll let them uh, uh, introduce them themselves uh, rather than read a lengthy bio. I know nobody <laughs> probably nobody wants me to do that, including the panelists. Uh, before I do, I just. Um, uh, a couple, uh, you know, logistical things, I guess, to note. Um, uh, as far as, uh, well, this, you know, our, our intent here is this webinar is public, open to any stakeholder. Um, we're really interested in, in good uh, questions that you have and, and views you want to share. So, um, so if you, um, if you um, uh, want, you could uh, utilize uh, a function, um, uh, there, there's a there's a button that say, that says Q and A and it has two little dialog boxes. If you uh, click on that, it will open up a window and you can you can uh, type in questions and we will keep an eye on that. Um, just for for background noise and things like that, all the attendees are muted um, right now. So um, <clears throat> uh, so please do provide provide questions there. So uh, okay, that aside, uh, I'm excited about this webinar. Thanks to all the panelists for being here. Um, uh, we, we thought we'd, um, uh, I, I won't ramble on too much longer, and then we can turn it over to each of our panelists to give some opening thoughts and statements, and then uh, jump into the Q&A and dialogue. Um, that's kind of the format. <laughs> um, so, in, uh, so pleased to be joined here by, uh, by Lauren Block with the National Governors Association, uh, Kimberly Horvath, Horvath with the American Medical Association, uh, Dr. Karen Ruban with the University of Virginia Center for Telehealth, and uh, Dr. Lucy Ide with uh, Remedy. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, I hope that I've, I've done a little bit of stage setting so far and, and uh, really would just like to, to jump in there, but um, uh, to, to jump in, but, uh, you know, uh, just to mention very briefly, you know, who's the Connected Health and Initiative and why do we care and why would we do a webinar like this? The Connected Health Initiative, uh, I'll keep it short, is... Uh, is a not-for-profit multi-stakeholder advocacy organization, policy and legal advocate, um, that, uh, that is aiming to advance um, uh, policy changes that will enable the responsible uptake and use of digital uh, healthcare, healthcare uh, tools and, and services across all modalities. So, um, so we're, we're a really active advocate um, uh, at the federal level and, and we're looking at, at at, op at opportunities at the states, which are so key, and I'm sure you'll hear about that in a moment um, uh, as well. Um, and uh, and uh, you know we can um, we can share this. Uh, we, we we try to develop some resources just for the common good, just to help people keep track at the federal level of all the stuff that's going on because it's really hard. Um, and there's a wide range of developments. Um, some I mean it's like every other day at least, sometimes every day that there's some new allowance, some new waiver, some new policy announced. For the duration of a public health emergency. We have this document where we try to keep track of all those and we distribute that post on our website. And maybe I or Alex can share a link in the chat to people with that. Just want to mention that resource if that's ever helpful to anyone on this webinar. Enough about the CHI. Let's get in the conversation. This is excellent. So um, again, uh, I, I, I think we were going to, I think Lauren and then Kim and Aaron and Lucy were, that was the order we were looking at. So 
I can turn it over to you, Laura. Go ahead. Thanks, Brian. Um, again, my name is Lauren Block. I work at the National Governors Association in the Center for Best Practices. And we function as something between a think tank and a consultancy for states, um, helping them by providing technical assistance. In the normal world, I lead our portfolio related to the healthcare workforce, uh, which includes telehealth. I also work on MCH, private health insurance, and data and interoperability. So I'll be focusing today a little bit on our work surrounding telehealth um, and surrounding a little bit about digital technology and interoperability as well, because in the COVID land, as I refer to it, um, my portfolio has largely stayed the same, but the projects that we're doing with states are a little bit different. Um, so as Brian mentioned, there has been a ton of federal activity uh, recently, including congressional activity, HHS activity, and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS activity. There have been at least nine actions through legislation, regulation, guidance, toolkit development, um, granting, giving different information about flexibilities in Medicare and Medicaid related to providers, as well as the associated facilities and telehealth requirements. But beyond that, significant authority really resides within state government. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the uh, activities that have happened through, largely through the executive branch. Uh, Kim will follow me giving some additional levels of details about um, different components of this sort of to complement some of what I'll discuss. But um, I did want to note that on our website, on our the COVID um, Part, portion of our website. We have a ton of resources, including a memo that we are periodically updating on uh, telehealth. We have a roadmap to recovery, which gets into reopening and contact tracing and other issues. So I'd encourage folks to take a look there. So because um, each state does have different laws and infrastructure and how they operate, there is a variability in the type of actions and the specific actors uh, in terms of where flexibilities lie. So there have been executive orders and proclamations, as well as some level of administrative flexibility available to state agencies. Uh, but some states have required legislation to make changes specifically around issues like licensure and telehealth. So while we're here to talk a lot about digital, I, before I dive specifically into some of the telehealth issues, I wanted to address licensure because that is really critical for any kind of healthcare provider to be able to practice across state lines. So with regard to licensure, in most states, healthcare providers have to maintain a license in the state in which they are rendering services to patients. There are opportunities to allow reciprocity, temporary waivers, or expedited license, licenses um, so that providers can practice across state lines. At this point, virtually all states and I think most territories have taken action in some regard with regard to licensure, whether it's reciprocity or um, waivers or otherwise. So there's been really robust activity. They haven't all done it in the same way, but they mostly have all taken some level of action. So basically, once a state has has taken action around licensure that can facilitate cross state practice in so much as uh, somebody is allowed to within their scope of practice and within the existing state laws for telehealth. So that's critical. Every state does have different laws with regard to telehealth. And so you have to adhere to those. In addition um, so to taking actions around licensure, states have taken some actions to simplify the process for participating, so in telehealth specifically. So in some cases, they've just, they've, they've just taken different steps to simplify, and so that could that can be around how they are establishing a patient provider relationship via telehealth. It could also be about expanding the types of providers that can offer telehealth. Um, I did want to note with regard to licensure that many states do participate in interstate compacts, not all of them, um, but the compacts aren't all the same. They simplify the process differently for providers, and they don't necessarily translate to automatic licensure or the ability to participate in telehealth. So for nurses, for instance, it can result in reciprocity in compact states, but for physicians, it just streamlines and expedites the process of licensure in each state, but you still need to hold a license. Um, so I already mentioned a little bit around um, the, the actual process you need for the licensing. 
also Kim is going to talk briefly um, after me about liability protections, where, which are a critical component of thinking about licensure and thinking about interstate um, activities and protections that are in place for providers. Um, in addition to the flexibility for how relationships are established, modality is also an important thing that states have been addressing. Many have lifted temporary restrictions. Um, historically, many states had a requirement for an audio-visual real-time two-way interaction. Um, and now many states have lifted that face-to-face -face requirement, are allowing some level of audio-only services. And this can be especially important for individuals who may not have access to smartphones. I know we think everyone does, but there are groups that don't, populations that don't. Um, Wi-Fi, fo some folks may not have, um, or other limitations that could make it challenging for them to meaningfully participate via telehealth. Another area that states have taken action in is with regard to originating and distance sites. Um, some states had restrictions on what type of site the provider or patient had to be located in uh, while give, providing or receiving telehealth services, and a lot of additional flexibility has been granted. Um, this started with largely, I think, CMS of their guidance around FQHCs and RHCs, federally qualified health centers, rural health centers, now allowing those both the provider and the patient to potentially be at home. Reimbursement has been another critical issue for telehealth. Um, some governors have included coverage and payment parity re requirements in their executive orders, meaning telehealth services have to be reimbursed at the same rate as in-person services. Also, some states have eliminated cost sharing um, for all medically necessary services provided via telehealth um, or potentially only related to COVID. So different strategies. Some states, um, a very limited number, are participating in EMAC, which is the Emergency Medical Assistance Compact. And when I say limited, I mean with regard to telehealth specifically. It wasn't originally designed for telehealth, but it is a multidisciplinary mutual aid compact, um, whereupon upon, with governor action, states are allowed to, can receive assistance from other states. It, doesn't, however, alone address coverage of reimbursement or state-specific restrictions on telehealth that may need to be addressed. So it's not a panacea, but it is a strategy. Um, I did want to note, talk for a moment about the future of telehealth. I think that this will probably be part of the conversation that we all have at the end, but I, I do want to note that you know, telehealth certainly has many clear benefits, such as the flexibility to pr let people receive care um, remotely when it might otherwise be dangerous for them to um, go out and about. And as of today, many of the provisions with states are tied to their initial declaration of emergency by the governor and they will stop once the public health emergency is lifted or until the governor otherwise ends the order whichever happens first um, state state guidance that is has typically been tied to an executive order and they're being reevaluated periodically like every 30 days so and and then there are states where there's legislation and the legislation expires at different times depending on the state. So as I mentioned, in some states they needed that legislative authority. I'd want to note that as important, as important as telehealth is, we do need to continue to ensure that individuals continue to have access uh, to in-person care. There are, not everything can be accomplished via telehealth and we need to think about the balance. We're hearing lots of stories about primary care and what's happening and the challenges um, with offices staying open, but there will always be that role for the brick and mortar practice and we need to ensure that we're protecting that even if there is some level of permanence that happens with some of these changes. Uh, so it does fill a need and it will continue to fill a need and we will continue to need that in per those in-person services as well, uh, especially as folks who are perhaps forgoing care right now, either because of um, uh, requirements or not requirements or encouragement to avoid seeking services, offices closing as they now reopen and people start getting services again. One other issue uh, that I briefly wanted to touch upon was contact tracing, not related to telehealth, um, but also in the realm of digital technology. Most states are really focused on this right now, and contact tracing is all about building out that public health infrastructure to support the follow-up as people are getting tested and their contacts are being reached. Uh, being reached out to in order to encourage them to potentially consider getting tested if there was a contact. 
Um, and there is associated data collection and analysis um, going on in a lot of systems and technology, as well as tools to support that manual follow-up with individuals with positive tests and their contacts. And some states also have been investing in app technology to, ex to support exposure notification as well. So that's a critical area of focus for states, not only the workforce, but the technology components. Um, we are also looking closely at the uh, public health data, at the testing data, and the systems that states are using, and how they are building up and getting ready um, and actually deploying, because they already are, uh, their, their infrastructure to be able to support the contacting, contact tracing initiatives and the sy syndromic surveillance that they also need to accomplish. So thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much. And I already see a couple of questions there. I'm just noting them. Hopefully I can read those in, but uh, unless so, unless you want to speak to any of them. Kimberly, go um, ahead. <laughs> let's see. So is that, so one of the questions, do you want me to, or do you want to, do you want to wait and let others go? Yeah. Why don't we let, if that's okay. Sure. We'll just make sure, I'll make sure I, I wrote them down here. So I'll make sure we circle, circle back and we can always distribute too and follow. Yes. I will say though, as a, just as a quick point, our, um, the telehealth memo and our healthcare workforce memo on our website does have a lot of these links and the information as well as uh, in it beyond FSMB, some others. So, sorry, go ahead. Thanks. Um, great, so should I get going, Brian? Um, thanks so much uh, to CHI and NGA for hosting this and, um, and um, inviting me to participate. Um, um, I'm Kim Horvath. I'm a senior legislative attorney with the American Medical Association. I work in our advocacy resource set center which is the state legislative arm of the AMA. Um, we work hand in hand with the state medical associations across the country. We don't lobby specifically at the state level, um, but we work directly with the state medical associations and also um, uh, with po national policymaking organizations like NGA, like NEIC and NCOIL and others. Um, so the AMA has been working on telemedicine for years, as has everybody else on here. Um, but really at the start of the pandemic, as, as many of, of all of you have realized as well, we knew that telemedicine was something that we needed to really get out in front of um, from both the federal and state policy level, but also in terms of helping our physicians on the ground, making sure that they had the tools and resources immediately to help um, quickly implement telemedicine at the practice level. Um, that's not something that I work on directly, but it is something that the AMA is doing. So I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of that. Um, I'll focus on the state level. And um, Lauren did a really good job of summarizing a lot of the key um, policy areas that states really needed to address to help expand the reach of telemedicine at the state level, um, whether it's through gubernatorial executive order, directives through um, state insurance departments or emergency regulations through the Medicaid program or, of course, through legislation for the very few states that are in session right now. Last count, I saw there were only eight states in session. So um, while there is some activity at the legislative level, it's definitely not kind of where the hot action is right now. Um, and a lot has been accomplished. Um, you know, as, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, almost all of the states have taken action um, in terms of Medicaid, in terms of expanding access or coverage. Of, um, of telemedicine and, and almost 40 states have taken action um, for uh, state regulated plans. Um, so tons of activity going on. Um, a lot had happened prior to this. Leading up, some states had really good laws in place already, states like Kentucky, um, but, but there was a lot that still needed to be done and a lot that still needs to be done to kind of get everybody to the level that they need to make sure that we all have coverage, access, and um, um, payment modalities and or payment in place um, to make sure we can ex fully expand the reach of telemedicine. Um, I'll um, go through and highlight some of the key um, policy areas that we focus on and then kind of give some state practices. So if, if people have a question of like maybe what state they can go to to look for for good um, language, kind of give some, um, some direction there. Um, not surprisingly, expanding coverage and payment of telemedicine are really key two key areas um, that are necessary to expand the reach of telemedicine. A lot of states have already taken action here. Um, Lauren already addressed, but just to again put an exclamation point on some of these um, policies. Um, we've seen executive orders that I would point to in Arizona, Massachusetts, and Washington have really good language on coverage and payment parity. 
And I think um, just to kind of give everybody some perspective, prior to COVID, um, only about 12 states, only about a dozen states had payment parity laws in place. And, and that's where they paid at the same rate uh, for telemedicine at the same rate as an in-person service. Um, right now, we have about 24 states. So we've doubled, but we're not quite where we need to be. Um, really, telemedicine is a vehicle for providing services to patients when it's clinically appropriate. Um, it's not necessarily, I think, especially when we think of virtual visits, um, we don't necessarily need to think of it in terms of a new service. It's just a different way of providing the service. Um, and so I think that's where the, the payment parity laws um, are really important in making sure that those are in place. Um, some insurance, uh, Department of Insurance uh, regulations to look at for good coverage and parity language. I would point to Maine's Department of Insurance. Um, they issued an emergency um, response order. Um, New Jersey Department of Insurance also has some good language. Texas has a good emergency, um, has good language and emergency regulation. Their language um, is similar to actually what's our model bill, which requires health plans to cover and pay for telemedicine services on the same basis and at the same rate as an in-person, as if the service was provided in person. Um, it's good catch-all language. And they also have, um, I think, some really good language in this um, 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 emergency regulation um, around documentation and requiring documentation um, to be no more than what would be required if that same service was provided in person. Um, and as we all know, an additional burden that can often limit access to care um, is kind of those additional regulatory documentation type of burdens. And so um, this is an important provision to have in place as well. On the Medicaid side, um, some states like Montana and North Carolina both have good language on suspending restrictions on originating site and geographic limitations for telemedicine services. Um, CMS did a really good job at that as well, but there's also a lot of work that needed to be done at the Medicaid level. A lot of state Medicaid programs had these kind of provisions in place. So a lot needed to be done to uh, make sure that we waived these types of provisions, at least for this um, current um, public health emergency, but, but hopefully beyond as well. Um, and, and then there's also some specific service types of services that, that, that um, some states have taken um, action to make sure that specific services are provided via, are able to be provided via telemedicine, um, such as treatment for mental health or substance use disorder, Colorado has really good um, language in place. Um, they adopted emergency regulations requiring state regulated plans to reimburse providers for behavioral health, mental health, and substance use disorder, the same as if that um, service was provided in person. Um, just to hone in on access for a moment, um, one of the things that we believe is really important is that we need to make sure that patients have access to telemedicine um, from the same physician who provides care to them in person. Um, we understand that, that there are some insurers that have separate telehealth networks or a select telemedicine provider from which they require their insurers to, to receive care. Um, as, as you can imagine, a lot of patients, obviously, especially those with chronic, with chronic conditions, um, have a relationship with their physician. It's really important to make sure that patients are able to maintain that relationship for continuity of care, um, just the trust and value that, um, that, that, that is um, intact, that patient-physician relationship. And with two physicians on the call, I'm sure they can attest to this. Um, that it's really important to maintain those relationships and really important to make sure that um, any policies that are in place that fragment or that care, um, that we find a way um, to make sure that we allow that um, physicians, those in-network physicians, to continue to provide care to their patients um, through telemedicine. A couple of states have, in executive orders, um, issued language that ensured all in-network physicians can provide telemedicine to their patients. Um, I would point to Illinois and Massachusetts as really good examples of that. Um, I'll throw in one more. Um, so there are some states um, that um, include language requiring health plans to inform physicians about, uh, and, and other healthcare professionals of how, about how they can appropriately, appropriately bill for telehealth services. There's a lot of confusion amongst physicians on how they appropriately bill for this. So any measures that we can take to make sure that they, that physicians and all healthcare professionals 
have that information is definitely a step in the right direction. Colorado's emergency regulation addresses this as well. Um, and then finally, liability. And liability is a really important piece um, to this. Lauren mentioned it. Um, we have encouraged medical liability carriers to cover telemedicine services for physicians. It should be part of their coverage, but we do encourage physicians to seek out and talk with their carriers specifically to make sure that it's covered. Um, we also support state efforts to provide civil immunity protections for physicians and other healthcare professionals um, who are providing COVID-related care, um, but also physicians who are providing care pursuant to a state directive or um, state order. Um, some examples of states with good civil immunity protections, New York, they kind of did a one-two punch. Um, Governor Cuomo issued an executive order um, providing civil immunity to uh, volunteer physicians. And then through legislation, the legislature then kind of came back around and swept everything up and said, you know, we need to provide broader civil immunity protections and making sure that physicians and other healthcare professionals who provide care related to a state order or directive during COVID-19 um, uh, are immune, uh, have civil immunity protections as well. Um, Connecticut has a good executive order and Massachusetts also has really good legislation, just as some examples to look at. And I will leave it at that. Oh, wait, one more thing. Um, I'll just put a plug in since I have the floor still just for a moment. Um, uh, a lot of the, the, the states I gave as examples and stuff you can find on our website. We have a, a document outlining um, kind of best practices for states in terms of telehealth. And so you can find links, direct links to the executive orders or legislation or regulation or whatever it is. So um, just a, a good, good. resource. Yeah. No, thank you. That's, uh, that's important. We got a couple of great questions so far about where to, where to be able to pull things together. So, uh, excellent. Um, Dr. Ruban, I guess you're up next. Can yeah. You hear you. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for the opportunity to join this group today. So I myself am a practicing pediatric cardiology and serve as director of the University of Virginia Center for Telehealth. We are uh, steering committee members of the Connected Health Initiative and are very grateful for the advocacy efforts of this terrific organization. Uh, every General Assembly session, we call upon them for additional help and support and you give it. I also want to give a huge thanks to the AMA um, and in particular the Digital Medicine Payment Advisory Group that has uh, advanced um, new CPT codes and advocated as well for uh, digital health. Um, I didn't hear a lot mentioned about the Commonwealth of Virginia and our two previous speakers, but I want to say give a huge shout out to my state. Uh, our, our governor is a physician um, and he has been incredibly supportive of telehealth in the Commonwealth of Virginia. But our state also has been pretty proactive over the years. In 2010, we had uh, our General Assembly pass private pay parity reimbursement legislation, and we have Medicaid coverage for telemedicine in bricks and mortar facilities since 2003 on a regular basis. But um, I, what I'd like to do is give you sort of an overview of what, what, how we have approached telehealth as a healthcare system and the changes that have been implemented post COVID 19 in addition to how we've been impacted by the public policy changes, which have been transformational. So the um, University of Virginia is home to a longstanding telemedicine program, and we support clinical consultations and follow-up visits, tele-ICU care, remote patient monitoring, store and forward services, e-consults, and virtual education to patients and providers. But we have a 150-site telehealth network in the Commonwealth of Virginia, which includes community and critical access hospitals, skilled nursing facilities and long-term care facilities, federally qualified health centers, free clinics, medical practices, correctional facilities, schools, and even EMS providers. And this is all pre-COVID-19. We offer telemedicine services spanning more than 60 different clinical subspecialties of healthcare. In addition, as a state-designated special pathogens hospital, Following the Ebola outbreak in 2015, we developed a model called ISOCOMS, my epidemiology and MICU colleagues and telemedicine team, in which we configured all rooms in our special pathogen unit with video conferencing to reduce provider exposure, improve the patient experience, um, and conserve PPE. Although our telemedicine program has primarily been externally facing, that is external partners, um, last year, heartened by both the relevant provisions of the 2019 Medicare Physician Fee Schedule and by clear messages from our own patients, 
seeking new models of care, we underwent an institutional multi-stakeholder strategic planning process to further expand our virtual care offerings. The COVID-19 public health emergency catapulted us into action to rapidly scale all elements of our strategic plan. And we are grateful we have a wonderful CEO who helped us to do this. So, um, the 1135 waivers and changes implemented in the recent COVID-19 interim final rule have further enabled us to advance that plan. Our state Medicaid program has taken similar action by enabling video and phone visits to the home. However, Virginia Medicaid, as of today, still does not cover remote patient monitoring services, as does Medicare, uh, across our managed care plans. Um, uh, our clinics have rapidly transformed ambulatory care by replacing in-person visits. We had a 90% reduction of in-person clinic visits, replacing them with virtual care provided to the homes of our patients. And we couldn't have reasonably done this without, those, uh, without the interim final rule for Medicare. Last week, we enabled more than 2,100 virtual visits per day, just replacing our in-person clinic visits. Um, within our hospital and our emergency department, we have now configured more than 80 isolation rooms with the ISACONS carts. This enables our own clinicians to provide video-based consultations from the health system locations other than directly within the special pathogens unit or other isolation rooms, and again, allows us to reduce exposure for our providers and um, conserve PPE. We are now just about to launch a new direct-to-consumer urgent care portal to our emergency physicians. Again, these policy changes have enabled all of this. Um, even though they were in our plan, they hadn't all been implemented, but now we're doing it. So we've also greatly expanded our remote patient monitoring programs, not just for our high-risk patients with chronic illness, but also for COVID-19 positive patients. So those latter patients, if symptomatic, are monitored by our nurse practitioners every four hours using video conferencing and biometric devices. In some cases, we're also monitoring patients with multifunction remote examination tools. We've greatly expanded our external facing relationships with long-term care facilities where a significant number of outbreaks in Virginia have occurred. As an example, last week, following a request from a long-term care facility with point prevalence testing showing more than 90% of their patients were COVID-19 positive, along with staff members, we rapidly scaled and delivered a telemedicine card and executed an agreement that comports with the Medicare conditions of participation standards that very same day, enabling our clinicians to make daily rounds and provide consultative support for the patients in those long-term care facilities. We've done so with other nursing facilities in our region. We've also ramped up our ambulatory e-consult program to also provide inpatient e-consults, and have implemented a COVID-19 Project ECHO statewide program the first week of the public health emergency. These transformations have required an all-hands-on-deck approach supported at the very top by UVA senior leadership and by our clinicians working in partnership with telemedicine, health IT, our billing and compliance teams, patient registration staff, contracting, our analytics groups, and of course, our patients. We are also a HRSA-designated telehealth resource center, one of about 16 across the country, and we've seen our request for technical assistance and training increase a thousandfold. Our website, just like you heard in GA and AMA, we have technical assistance through our website, matrc.org, matric.org. A matric maintains a rich uh, website with updates on changing policies, technical assistance uh, for all seeking guidance but clearly there's still much work need to be done and we have to keep up with the daily, almost daily changes in public policy to empower clinicians to do the same. So we're very grateful for policy advancements in telehealth and the significant investments in technology and provider support within our own institution and equally so by others. As such, we implore our federal and state partners to ensure that the digital health reforms and investments that were rapidly scaled in response to this public health emergency will endure. Think of all the work that's been done to establish these programs, expand these programs, the investments by the FCC and uh, you know, other federal agencies. And I would say that whether in preparation for what likely will be a cyclic nature of COVID-19 or in preparation for any future public health emergency, healthcare providers and systems must be ready. And with the amazing response from our patients, 
it's not likely that the genie is going to be going back into the bottle. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share our experience as a frontline caregiver in this process. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful. Very, very much. We really appreciate it. Uh, Lucy. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thanks also to CHI for putting this together and for all of your hard work and advocacy and keeping all of us informed with these constant changes over the past two months. So I really appreciate it. Um, so I'll sort of round this out from the perspective of a technology company working in the remote patient monitoring space, as well as working directly on the COVID-19 response and share our experience of, you know, how this is actually playing out in the customers and health systems who we serve. Um, so the two main areas where we're working is in remote patient monitoring. So versus some of the previous panelists, um, we're really focused on the asynchronous store and forward technologies. Um, and the policy changes that have happened there have just been amazing and transformative, as others have said. I mean, some of these nagging problems that created friction in the adoption of these technologies have just disappeared. Um, and by that, I mean co-pays for patients related to remote patient monitoring, specifically with Medicare, um, the need to only offer that kind of service. To yes, might have had a connectivity issue. <laughs> I can respond to the question that came, that came up earlier, if that's helpful. I can. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so sure. there was a question around, there were a few questions. One was around the Federation for, of State Medical Board webpage and asking whether or not they're clear on licensure changes and flexibilities. They have increasingly uh, developed more and more sophisticated information with now multiple pages of information about licensure, about telehealth, about retirees, um, and they have links to everything. So sometimes you do have to kind of dig to see the specifics of what each state is doing to go beyond their site. but they, they have great resources there, but we also do um, on our webpage provide, um, I'm sorry, on our, in our memo provide other resources. With regard to EMAC states, uh, that was another question, who are the EMAC states? Mm -hmm. They're technically all states are, are part of EMAC. It's just a question of activating EMAC. There was a template, a new template um, created, and maybe some of others of you on the line can speak more about this, uh, that states can use that's specific to telehealth. I believe that North Carolina has used that template. I am not sure um, if any others have pursued it, but all states are EMAC states. It's just a question of which ones have activated as part of COVID response, and they could have been for other things like personnel or for equipment or, or other resources. So. Okay. Does anyone else have anything to add there? Thank you. Okay, well. Kim might oh. wanna, oh, is she back? Is that I'm you? back. <laughs> <laughs> we just, um, all, all we did was we, we answered, the, Lauren gave some helpful uh, input there about some of the, uh, a question about, that, that have been asked in the chat. So we can pick up. Where you left off. Super. Well, you know, I hope everyone understands par for the course of working from home and, you know, schooling from home and all of those things with internet connections. Um, yeah, so just to pick back up, I think I was saying that, you know, we've been working, um, you know, directly in the remote patient monitoring space, monitoring, you know, these patients with chronic diseases who, as mentioned by the previous panelists, you know, have all been sort of encouraged to stay home, face-to-face -face appointments have gotten turned into remote appointments or just into remote monitoring of these conditions. So removing some of the barriers at the federal level has been um, really impactful and meaningful to the practices who we serve. Um, I think where we still see some friction remaining there is in keeping this, right, once the crisis is over, um, hopefully this is the new normal. Hopefully we're not going to go back to um, having co-pays um, for Medicare recipients. Um, we do need better coverage at the state level by Medicaid plans for remote patient monitoring. And, you know, again, from a physician's point of view, it's very difficult for them to adopt new technologies and new practices that they can't apply to all of their patients across the board. So today, while they may have coverage for Medicaid and some of the private pay, um, not having coverage for their Medicaid patients is both not good for those patients, but it's also logistically just more complex for the practice. 
Um, and then it was also previously mentioned that uh, there's been some great work done on telehealth coverage for FQHCs and rural health clinics. We need to see the same thing um, for remote patient monitoring, and it's, it's been a little bit mysterious as to why that has not been addressed yet. Uh, we've heard that that is on the radar, that they are working on that at the federal level, but um, my understanding, and I'm constantly you know, sort of in contact with the folks at CHI to see if they've heard anything new, um, that you know, has not yet been resolved. Um, so you know, it's, it's great to see the rapid expansion, you know, thousand-fold expansion and in interest in remote monitoring, and, um, but we need to be able to you know, make this the new normal because it is so much more convenient for patients, and it's obviously very applicable to these uh, patient populations with chronic diseases, many of whom are the same patients, right, who are having worse outcomes from COVID. So however long um, we're going to continue to experience this as it sort of waxes and wanes in the communities, we need to keep these vulnerable patient populations protected. Um, the second part of what we have been working on related to COVID-19 and digital health technologies was also um, referenced earlier on the call in terms of, you know, contact tracing, but all of these digital screening, triage, monitoring technologies um, around COVID-19, right? And how do we um, keep our healthcare workers protected by screening populations before they enter the healthcare system and ensuring that they're not um, creating exposures to other to patients receiving normal care or our healthcare workers? Um, and how do we support these patients who are being told to monitor and manage their symptoms at home? And so we've been doing work in that space, supporting health systems with patient reported outcomes tools and connected technologies to support patients who were managing uh, COVID-19 at home, help spot those who are deteriorating in terms of worsening symptoms, and also help spot some of the other needs that are arising, right? There's a tremendous burden of uh, mental health um, distress that's being caused by the COVID pandemic. And so we've seen about a quarter of patients identifying uh, mental health challenges while they are quarantining at home. And we're also identifying those who don't have access to their usual medications, right? So the last thing we want is because they're being told to stay home for their COVID to stop taking their hypertension or diabetes medications because they can't go to the pharmacy to get a refill, right? And so that's where using technology to connect the dots of that patient to their plan, to their physician, um, because, you know, there are already resources in place through mail order, through home delivery to get those medications. Um, and the same with food. So we have a, around 8 to 10% of patients who were saying, saying, I don't have adequate food when I'm quarantining at home. Maybe they don't have family who can bring them that. They can't afford to have meal delivery services. So there are a lot of pieces to this equation of how we can leverage technology to keep patients um, safe at home, you know, to give them some instruction on how, um, what to be looking out for, but to also, you know, I really like the points made earlier of technology and telemedicine and remote monitoring really needs to connect patients to those providers who they have a relationship with and who they have trust already built with. Um, so um, that's, that is what we're seeing and, and happy to answer any questions related to the technology piece of this. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks to all of you for the sharing these, uh, these thoughts. Now I, I have, um, I know there, there was one good question we were able to touch on already, which is excellent. Hey, great. Um, and I have some back pocket ones I can ask while you folks out there are thinking about further ones. Um, let's see here, a number of, some of them you guys have touched on already. So one that, one that, that, that I was, I, I've been, I was curious about though, um, you know, is already at the federal level for, for some time, there's been a lot of buzz, <laughs> different kinds of buzz, depending on who you ask about, you know, about how, about, health data interoperability, the flow of, of health data, siloing of health data, you know, other phrases like that, right? Prompting HHS's uh, Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT to develop a uh, information, a, a rule defining illegal information blocking and, and, uh, and, and basically an enforcement mechanism for it. And I was curious if, um, 
if uh, you all see how that rule, well, if, if health data flows are, are a hindrance, are, are opening up during this uh, time, particularly like not, not just within states, but amongst states, um, are those still a hindrance that maybe need to be addressed somehow? If, if so, how? Um, and, to, and I just open that up to anybody who'd like to comment on it. I can start um, and just say, you know, I think I don't remember the catchphrase about crisis as an opportunity, but uh, I think, you know, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of variation in how states do things. There's also variation in where control lies. In some states, there's a lot of local control as opposed to others where things are more centralized at the state level. Some states have really robust health information exchanges, whereas others don't. And they all have different levels of sophistication with their public health reporting, um, which is a function that has existed for a long time. It just hasn't had to be scaled to the level that we're currently dealing with. And so there are a lot of, I think, efforts underway right now to try and get more consistent data coming in when a provider requests labs to um, for testing and then making sure that the right demographic information is in there to feed uh, public health reporting, to feed syndromic surveillance. Um, so it's all, you know, it goes all the way from the start of the time that a patient is seen all the way through, you know, the contact tracing or the syndromic surveillance um, that, we're, that we're thinking about now. So all to say, I think um, there are challenges, there is variation, and there are efforts underway to increase levels of sophistication. Um, and also to there, you know, we've seen also initiatives, Duke released a paper last week specifically about certain things that can be done with labs with regard to the National Syndromic Surveillance Program. Um, so, so there, there, it were, it's happening. I think there are efforts underway to, to improve. Okay. And Brian, I'm happy to weigh in that um, last month in one of the CDC and MWR reports, I think it was reported that 5.8% of the test results that were submitted, positive tests, had any patient information tied to them, right? Which is a huge problem if we're not getting demographics, underlying medical conditions, anything about these positive cases other than positive. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, it, it, it is not a capability problem in terms of interoperability and, you know, CDC and FDA and everybody has sort of bought into the concept of interoperability. Fire is the common application program interface that should be used. I think hopefully we will see acceleration of adoption in real world use cases due to this crisis. Right, and, and that's part, part of what we have been um, working on with clinics in, in, the popu in the community is to say, how do we tie your testing data to your population level data in a way that more efficiently allows you to report, but also gives you insights in your own population of, you know, syndromic symptom surveillance with testing and how does that help you in your operations identify your most vulnerable patients? Great. Okay, well, I've got another one that got submitted there, and I'll modify it a little bit here because I, I do think it's a good question. Um, because I, I, you know, I, I, depending on the audience, and especially for people who are a little bit newer to sometimes an unfortunate nuance in law and regulation as to what is telehealth and versus remote patient monitoring and things like that, um, I, I think, you know, at least for, for as I think about it, uh, for better or worse, I, I think about the Medicare system, which is more or less defining a Medicare teleservice as a live voice, live video voice call. And then there's like everything else, right? And I know that that can vary from state to state. Um, but so I'm, I guess I'm thinking about maybe we can just help people better understand, maybe through some examples, you know, some COVID-19 examples of how, how they're being utilized now. Now, this is probably a question for you, Lucy, or... Or uh, or Dr. Ruban, I, I guess, uh, uh, but uh, and 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 both Kim and Lauren too, I guess. Uh, but um, you know, asynchronous store and forward remote physiologic monitoring. Um, you know, how can I think most people get like a, can think like, pick up my phone, live voice video. That's a telehealth visit. What kind of examples, you know, in the context of COVID nineteen, are you guys kind of living right now that can help, you know, make 
make that RPM use case kind of more real <laughs> for people so they can really, really visualize it. Um, I can speak to what we've done. Uh, it, we've got, it's more and more, we're monitoring more patients with different conditions. We're scaling. One of the, one of the areas that we've scaled in the last several months is uh, remote patient monitoring for high-risk pregnancies. Um, and even though, again, it's not a covered service, it, we, our state has identified and articulated a priority of the uh, high rates of maternal mortality. And so we just said, whether it's covered or not, we're doing it. Um, and uh, the other thing is the technology that we have selected for our remote monitoring program, and most of it is the same technology, enables video visits as well. And so not only are we doing the asynchronous remote patient monitoring, getting data sent, which does go to our electronic medical record in terms of trended data to the EMR, but we can activate the video visit for our providers to actually leverage that investment in the technology to the home of the patient and do a video visit as well. And that's obviously a separately covered service if it's a documented as a video visit um, and um, build appropriately. So we've leveraged our investment in the technology to provide a broader range of services as well, and in addition to scaling up remote monitoring to different populations. Yeah, that's interesting. We've actually seen um, growth in the same area and monitoring, you know, blood pressure, or diabetes, and high-risk pregnancies. Um, I think because folks get that right of keeping this vulnerable population, mom and then mom and baby, away from the health system where they could potentially be exposed, um, even though it's probably the right thing to do anyway, right? <laughs> so, um, and then I think at the other end of the spectrum, we've seen a lot of interest, say, in patients with heart failure, patients. Um, with hypertension who may have other comorbidities and are quite sick and, you know, not bringing those kind of patients into the office just for a blood pressure check or just for a weight check. Um, those really lend themselves well to that store and forward type technology. And, okay. Uh, Brian, I would just add that one other area that we've been hearing of uh, physicians using remote patient monitoring specific to COVID-19 patients is using pox oximeters, right, um, and just to be able to monitor patients um, with those symptoms um, um, remotely, so. Great. Great, thanks. Well, Brian, one more thing I can add, and you know, I do have a conflict of interest because I serve on the advisory board of Tido Care, but there, that, that provides a tool, they, and, and there are electronic stethoscopes that can be deployed to COVID positive patients as well. Not, Tido has other things that are incorporated into it, but there are many electronic stethoscopes that can support with the use of an oximeter, the examination of the patient. Excellent, thanks. Well, um, I guess I, uh, they wouldn't give me a nickel if I didn't bring up artificial intelligence when I'm talking about stuff. So, I, I, you know, believe me, I, uh, I, there's a lot of hype. Let's just be straight up about that, right? There's a lot of hype and a lot of people want, and people honestly, more times than not, including in policymaking circles, think of movies they watch. They think of a robot doing, you know, and when we're talking about realistic um, and, and, you know, like clinically validated, you know, tools available today that more, more augment what a clinician is doing than replace them by any means right now, you know, and especially with workforce shortages, I think that that's pretty, pretty important. And, and some of those things are quite real right now. And, I, you know, one thing that the CHI just, for example, has, has, has done is, is uh, encourage the Food and Drug Administration to clarify some kind of streamlined pathway to the market for um, imaging tools assisted by AI, augmented, that can, um, that can look at images of a lung and, and, and either for the purposes of, of diagnosis or treatment of COVID-19, you know, as, as one interesting use case. Um, I am really curious if at the state level, you know, how, how are, how are these, these uh, algorithmic augmenting tools, if you want to be more precise than just saying AI and making people think of a movie or something like that, how are those being re received, you know, pre-public health emergency versus now? Or is there been some more pickup uh, at the state level support in some way, whether it's removing a barrier or providing a new incentive? I'm curious about what you all think about that or your assessment. <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll answer that. <laughs> um, um, I guess I haven't honestly 
heard much about AI during the COVID-19 pandemic. That doesn't mean it's not happening, but it just hasn't been kind of on the radar that I've necessarily seen. I, there was, um, there had been discussions at the state level pre-COVID. We had actually done um, in trying to kind of educate our colleagues at the state level on AI. Um, it is kind of a new and, as you said, very hyped area right now. Um, it continues to be, but just making sure that, um, that, that everybody understands the terminology because I think, and I think it actually is nice to talk about in, like this setting when we're talking about telehealth and telemedicine, because I think that one of the things that when we talk about AI, we can use um, the work that's been done in telemedicine as, as kind of a, um, a lesson to, to how we, we look at AI. And I think one of the most important things that we can take away from telemedicine and how um, state policies have developed on telemedicine is the importance of um, making sure that everybody is on the same page and using the same terms and having kind of uniform terminology. And so that's something that I think has been kind of stressed as we're kind of starting going down that AI track, um, making sure that first and foremost, maybe we have a set, of, um, a set of terms and terminology that we can all kind of agree on moving forward. Because I think some of the problems, not problems, but I think some of the challenges that we're seeing at the state level and ramping up and, and, and seeing um, continuity across States on terms of coverage and payment and other um, um, policies related to telemedicine is just there's not a lot of uniformity in the term even telemedicine right as as you said is it is it just virtual visits is it remote patient monitoring what is included in that term and it varies by state um, so some states include remote patient monitoring some states include store and, you know other store and forward technologies some states only include virtual visits. Um, so I, um, I think that's kind of maybe um, kind of a lesson that we can use to, uh, telemedicine to kind of help us in kind of that AI space that, that we will be moving into shortly. <laughs> well, uh, thanks. And by the way, I give myself a nickel when I say they give me a nickel just because I'm excited about AI all the time. So I give myself a nickel and it zeroes out. But <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, that's great. So, I mean, I realize here we're, we're uh, kind of reaching the end uh, of, our, of our time. So that last question, I'd love to hear from, from all of you about, and we've touched on this. A couple of folks, I think, rightly have touched on this, is the longer, and I, I won't rant about this because I, I love to talk about it. Not a rant, but, you know, go on and on about it. Um, the, I, you know, I think about how the longer the public health emergency goes on and the longer these new allowances are in place, whether they're new payments or enforcement discretion or something else. Um, you know, it seems like, you know, people getting used to patients and clinicians getting used to using these new technologies. Um, how much of that do you think realistically will become the new norm? It seems unrealistic to me, you know, that we're going to go back to exactly the way that it was that, you know, uh, Congress or CMS is going to tell a Medicare beneficiary in Idaho that they need to resume going driving two hours each way to a doctor's office when they could have just, you know, done even a live, just a simple live voice video call for for a uh, for a serve, you know, for to receive a service or something. Uh, there's my bias I've exposed, I guess. I I don't think that that's my, you know, I'm I'm really curious though where where you guys, you know, if any predictions that you want to make, what is the new norm? Um, uh, you know, in the short and in, in long term, even. Well, I just want to weigh in from the perspective of the health system. I sure hope it endures, and we'll do everything we can to advocate and work with partners to see that it endures. One of the things that I am heartened by, though, is that the activation of more CPT codes will allow data analytics, even at the level of Medicare and Medicaid, so that we can actually inform decision making in the Congressional Budget Office when legislation moves forward because you know, I think that has been such a challenge for us. There hasn't been a lot of adoption because there hadn't been payment. And when bills are scored, it's always scored as a cost and not a cost savings. So I look forward to having this discussion and seeing that you know, in the legislative process, we're, we're at all feasible using data that has been generated by this pandemic, um, this public health emergency as a background for uh, expansion in the more permanent process. 
in terms of eliminating the 1834 M restrictions. Um, as I kind of previously said, I think, you know, we, between the 50 states, the federal government, territories in DC, there are a lot of different um, places where I think we'll see different things happen. And I think in some ways, these changes that are currently temporary could be seen as pilots. There might be parties who see it, say, this is not that bad. This is not as scary as it seemed like it would be. Um, but there also will, we will need to resume some of that face-to-face, -face, that continuity. People who are not getting diagnosed right now they're, because they're avoiding getting treatment and that might not happen with um, you know a one-time telemedicine visit with a new provider you know some of that I think we will I think we're gonna see a mixture uh, I think we're gonna see some things go back to how they were and we're gonna see some evolution and change and hopefully what we hold on to are the things that are working best that create the most efficiencies but that also um, leverage the primary primary health care system um, and the rest of the infrastructure that that we really need in place yeah, I guess um, I would echo, you know, just the, the hope that, it, that many of these policies do stay in place, but I don't think that we should take it um, for sure as a sure thing, or I don't think we should take it as um, that it's automatic by any means, you know, as, as Lauren said initially, right, the executive orders are going to end, right, or a lot of emergency, um, um, emergency uh, insurance regulations, those are going to end. So we have to be prepared for that next step and making sure that those policies that we want to move forward advocate to have that happen. But then also, um, but there are going to be some policies that, um, that, that may need to, to, to roll back or change or and we have to, to make sure that we account for those as well. Um, so, but I think any data, as Dr. Ruban said, any data that we can collect at this moment during the public health emergency is critical. And that's going to really help shape um, kind of the, the advocacy on it moving forward. Uh, I'll, I'll weigh in just to close it out on that question. So I, I think, um, and put in a plug for CHI, that you guys do a great job of trying to solicit case studies, you know, gather data from your members and from the community about what's working in order to take that to the hill and really connect the dots of what's happening at the front line in communities and how that's so dramatically impacted by policy. So I would hope and encourage folks to gather those case studies and, you know, gather your own data and share it widely, you know, publish it, write up case studies that you share with advocacy groups like this, um, because I think there's going to be a lot of storytelling that needs to happen after this crisis is over to justify, you know, the budget commitments and everything else it would take to keep these policies in place. Uh, absolutely, I, I I couldn't. I, I that's put so well. <laughs> I do. I I couldn't. I agree with what everybody's saying there, but particularly I do think that you know your both data and anecdotes are going to you out there experiences are going to be super important as uh, as I think you know people policymakers at all levels really do consider uh, what the new norm is. So uh, I realize we're just a tad over. So I do want to. <laughs> I guess that, 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 that does it for our webinar today, but I, I truly, I, I thank all of you, really, it's awesome for you to join us and share uh, your expertise, your experiences. Um, I really do wanna thank too, as well, all the, the folks who joined us today for sharing their, their questions and their in, just their interest in being here. Um, uh, thank you so much. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll close it. <laughs> Thanks all. <laughs>